church this morning. Uh, well done on getting here uh, on time, um, even with the clock change. Um, it's good to see us gathering together. And uh, it's great to have Fran Newby with us this morning. He's going to be uh, leading our service. Uh, he's come over from Chelmsford and uh, arranged to do this at, at quite short notice. So we're really grateful that Fran is here today. And just to, to say for this week, our prayer meeting will be um, by Zoom on Wednesday at 7.30. Normally it's going to be the first Wednesday of the month we do that, but we're going to have a, a special speaker on the first Wednesday of the month, so we sort of moved it back a week. I'll say more about that later. And uh, finally, just a reminder of BCT Prayer Letter, Biblical Creation Trust. That's uh, the other organisation I work for. We've got a prayer letter for that uh, on at the back. And uh, I'll be saying more about some other things coming up later in the service. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Fran. Mm -hmm. Good morning to you all. Um, lovely to be among you today to worship uh, the Lord together. And we begin with the words of Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Let's pray together as we begin our time. Our Father in heaven, we praise you that you are the Lord. You are the one who exists and has always existed. We praise you that you are eternal and unchanging, that nothing that goes on in this world takes you by surprise, but all things are under your sovereign power. And we praise you that you delight in the praises of your people and you call us in words like these to come to worship you and to enjoy being your people. We confess that we are utterly unworthy of this privilege, that we come stained by sin, and unable and in some cases unwilling to give you the glory that you're due. We pray that you would forgive us. We pray that by your Spirit's power we might be strengthened to worship you this morning, that we might go on our way with great joy. We pray that you would help each one here in their hearts to forsake sin that clings so closely, to turn back to you this morning, to know that you are the Father who forgives, the one who welcomes his wandering children back. We thank you for that wonderful picture of that in the parable of the prodigal son, that the father runs to meet his erring son. And we pray that each one of us would return to you this morning, whatever weeks we've had. May our worship that we bring to you through your son be acceptable and pleasing to you. And Lord, we ask that you would bless each one here with grace and peace. And we don't want to forget those worshipping you in other lands and in other parts of this country, perhaps doing so at great personal danger and cost. We ask that their eyes would be lifted to see eternal reality, that like that servant with Elisha, who was encouraged to look and to see that those with them were far more than those against them. We pray that your people everywhere would take courage, that though they will have trouble in this world, that the Lord Jesus has overcome the world. And we bring all these prayers to you in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's lift our voices to the Lord with our first hymn, O God Beyond All Praising. We stand to sing together.
Well, we come to our time, which is sometimes known as a children's talk, but uh, I sometimes think it would be better named a taster or a trailer. Uh, this is very much relating to the theme of the message that I'll be bringing later from Luke chapter 12. Uh, but I wonder if anyone recognises this building. Can anyone tell me where this is? Yes. Buckingham Palace. And do you know who lives there? The Queen. Here she is. So actually, it turns out that our Queen doesn't live there very often, but she does certainly live there sometimes, and sometimes she has very, very special meals there. And this is one of the, ban the, the banqueting hall in Buckingham Palace, if you ever get a chance to visit during the summer. It's a, a sight to behold. Um, but often, this is the place where the Queen hosts foreign dignitaries and leaders from other parts of the world, um, and she would sit just under those red curtains that you can see to um, and as you can see, it's a magnificent spread. And I just want you to imagine, though, for the, the purposes of this story, that um, the servants are getting everything ready, and all the cutlery is going out, and the candlesticks and the flowers, and they're waiting for the queen to arrive. And she's a little delayed, um, but eventually, as they wait, they see uh, their sovereign approaching, uh, holding their breath, hoping that they've got everything right and that none of the food's overcooked or anything like that. Um, and then something quite strange happens, that the queen approaches uh, one of the servants and takes her crown off and says, here you go, you wear this. And then she asks for the servant's apron and the servant hands it over and you have to pretend that the London Underground isn't on it. Um, and the queen 90 years of age, nevertheless, doesn't have a problem, straps on the apron, and then encourages the servants and says, no, you, you go and sit at the tables. You go and enjoy the meal. I'm going to serve you. Some of you are looking a little confused. That would be very odd, wouldn't it? It would be very strange for the queen to don the apron and start to serve the food whilst the servants sat and went, oh, I'm not quite sure what all these different bits of cutlery are for, um, and she was the one who served them the meal. It's a shocking thing, because that's just not what happens. The normal order of things is that servants serve, and rulers get served. But we're going to hear a story later from God's Word about Jesus talking about himself, doing exactly what I've just described that the Queen would do in this story. And we read in Luke 12, 37, and Jesus talks about this. He says, it will be good for these, uh, those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, he will have them recline at table, and will come and wait on them. So that's Jesus ex explaining something of his heart uh, as he comes and has, we wait for his return. This is what we will find him doing for us if we're waiting eagerly for him like those servants were for the queen. King of Kings Majesty. Let's stand and sing.
Well, good morning to those who've uh, only managed to join uh, recently. Um, let's turn to read God's Word now together. Um, you can read from the screen if you like. Uh, the reading is Luke chapter 12, um, starting at verse 32. And uh, if you want to pick it up in the Pew Bibles, then it's page 736. 736. So just, we're, we're actually picking up in the middle of a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. Um, it said in, in verse 1 that a crowd of many 10,000 had gathered so that they were trampling on one another. Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying... So we go on, and there was 30 verses before, but then we read in verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now we're going to sing a song now uh, called Behold the Power of His Word. Uh, it's going to be slightly different because it will come up, uh, the music will come through the computers uh, and the words will, will come up on the screen. Um, so let's join our voices with those uh, in the recording um, and this is also the song in which those who are heading up to junior church um, can head out for that. Okay, let's stand to sing, Behold the Power of His Word. Word is living 
pray before we come to God's word. Father in heaven, we praise you that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, sharp to the dividing of joint and marrow, of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And Father, our hearts are laid bare before you this morning, and so we pray that you would be using your powerful, creative word, both to tear down and to build up. Uh, We pray that you would uproot sin in our lives and plant righteousness there. Uh, We pray that none of us would harden our hearts to you this morning. Please, may you help me to speak your word faithfully, uh, to capture in feeble words something of the glory of the Lord Jesus. We pray that each one would receive that portion of living bread that they need this morning. And we ask all things, including remembering uh, the children up in Children's Church, that they too would um, be blessed as they come under the sound of your word as well. Please uh, help those who are leading that uh, to speak powerfully and truthfully. And may your spirit uh, be over our gatherings now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please do turn in your Bibles back to that passage in Luke, uh, chapter 12, it's page 736. What do you think of Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? Surely one of the most important questions in all of life. Because how you answer it affects your entire outlook. How you respond to crises like war, inflation, personal illness. How you spend your money and your time. Who you marry, and whether you stay married to that person. And what you prioritize in life. What do you think of Jesus this morning? And it may be that you've come to this meeting genuinely unsure, interested in Jesus, but not yet ready to follow him. Or perhaps you are really convinced that he is the Son of God. But if you're honest, you remain a little suspicious of him. Perhaps his demands just seem too much and beyond what you're capable of. Perhaps you are disappointed and thinking that he doesn't seem to be doing what he should be doing, either in your life or perhaps on the world stage. Or perhaps he seems distant and doesn't connect with your day-to-day struggles. What do you think of Jesus? Now, this teaching that Jesus brings to his disciples comes as some of those thoughts were doubtless going through their minds. 
he's been quite clear with them that they will face severe persecution for following him. But also that more subtle temptation to compromise their commitment to him and to base their hope of security and joy and fame on this life only. And they needed to know what you and I need to know from this story in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 38 which is really this, that Jesus really is the master worth waiting for. He really is the master worth waiting for. And he's the master who's coming back. And he's coming back to rule this earth with justice and peace. And as we read in verse 37 here, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Or as it might be translated, blessed are those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. At that time when Jesus returns, those waiting for him will be blessed with blessings beyond which any eye has seen or ear has heard. And Jesus tells this story to his disciples and he's ensure that it's recorded in Scripture and brought me here to you today to proclaim to you this Jesus, that you will be stunned by who he is and excited about his coming. And this excitement will in turn shape all the ways in which you think and feel and act in this life. Jesus really is the master worth waiting for. And we're going to see that here under two headings. Firstly, the heart of it really, that Jesus is the master worth waiting for, the master beyond your wildest dreams. And secondly, an encouragement, therefore, to invest and to shape your life in the light of his return. So firstly, then, let's consider Jesus, the master beyond your wildest dreams. So in this story that Jesus tells to his disciples and a number of others around it, he pictures two sets of characters, the master and the servants. Uh, And he intends them and us to understand that he is the master and that his disciples, or you if you're following Jesus today, are his servant. And we read in verse 40, just at the end of the reading, he says that you you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And that's a phrase that Jesus uses many times in the Gospels to refer to himself. He is the returning master. And that makes you and me servants, or sometimes even translated slaves, slaves of Jesus. And really, there's only two options as far as relating to Jesus is concerned. You're either a servant of Jesus or you're his enemy. There is no other way. And immediately, such talk kind of raises all kinds of suspicions uh, in our minds. Um, Because the only analogy we have of a master is human masters, and they're invariably pretty bad. Whether that's self-serving politicians, uh, or um, harsh parents that you might have experienced, uh, or maybe demonic school teachers who've left their scars on your body and your mind. And we naturally tend to project those negative views of authority figures onto God, thinking that he is just like these nasty masters. And maybe that's where you are today. Interested in Christianity, but talk of Jesus being Lord, that Jesus being the one who's going to tell you what to think and how to act in certain situations is actually quite troubling. Um, Or maybe you're a Christian, but you are holding back on God in some way because deep down you don't trust him to be your master. Well, keep listening. Jesus told this story to show you that he's different to the other masters you know about. So he is a master, but he's a master who serves his servants. Jesus is this master who is beyond your wildest dreams. He's different to any other human master. He's a master who serves. And here we get to the heart of the text in verse 37. 
The master comes, and here's what Jesus says will happen. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. This is a shocking passage. I remember reading it as part of a sort of daily Bible reading program a few years ago. And just as one does, and perhaps I'm not the only one, it was fairly late at night, I was sort of perhaps slightly drifting off as I was reading, and then suddenly I got to this verse, and I just sort of sat up and just went, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Um, and it really is just utterly shocking. It's a stunning role reversal. It's not the done thing. Like we had in the sort of trailer earlier for the children and for all of us, that imagine the queen coming to a banquet and then serving the servants. It's not the done thing. Jesus knows it's not the done thing. He goes on later to tell a story about servants waiting for a master, a different story this time, and the standard roles are performed. The master eats first, the servants eat, and there's no special commendation for servants who are ready because that's their job. That's normal servanthood. But instead we have here, the master lets his servants relax while he serves them a rich meal. And Jesus wants you to know this morning that this is what he will do when he returns. He is the master who serves his servants beyond your wildest dreams. So before we go on, be stunned, be amazed. Jesus wants to serve you. This is Jesus who is incomparably great. He is God, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, infinite in all his perfections, speaks galaxies into being, defines the details of the smallest subatomic particle, maintains their motions moment by motion, by moment. Right now he's in heaven surrounded by countless angelic beings receiving the worship that he's due and yet he will gladly stoop to serve you. You who are one of billions of people on the planet, you who perhaps others take little note of, you who have ignored and disobeyed him, the Son of God wants to serve you. And if you're still unsure, then look at his track record. This is not someone who makes promises that he doesn't keep. He became a man, taking the very nature of a servant and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The cross was the ultimate display of Jesus not wanting to be served, but serving to save a rebellious people and to do what we could not do and did not even want to do. Jesus is the master who serves his servants. And he continues to serve you day by day, using his church, filling you with more and more grace so that you can serve one another, so that through the church you would receive Jesus' continual service. And the shock in this story is that Jesus didn't just serve for a while so that one day you can serve him. But being a servant is his very nature, and he will carry it on for all eternity. It will delight his heart to serve you day after day in his Father's kingdom. Now that is a master beyond your wildest dreams, one who serves his servants. So let's just savour this imagery. Bleary-eyed, exhausted servants who might have stayed up until 4 or 5 a.m., expecting perhaps another hour or so of graft before they can get to bed. Now they recline on the couches with their master treating them some much-needed food. Jesus is preparing the same for you, child of God. Be amazed. And let that amazement melt the suspicion and the fears in your heart so that you will love him and wait for him. So that was Jesus, the master beyond your wildest dreams. Now the application of this really to invest in his return. And on the one hand here, uh, Jesus' return is something that we cannot do anything but wait for. 
It's, it's seeing these stories that the servants don't know when the master's coming back. They just have to be waiting. But waiting in the Bible isn't something passive. And you see that in this story that they are to be dressed, ready for service, to keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. Because they know that the master's coming back, they are to take concrete actions to make sure they stay awake. They're to act differently in the light of their master's return. And so I've summarized this as being there to invest in his return. That's, I think, the attitude that we need to take to the Lord Jesus' return, not just to be passive and to wait and to think, well, when it happens, it happens, but to actually actively invest in it. We've seen um, over the last few weeks the invasion of Ukraine. Well, it was a good job that the Ukrainians invested in the military hardware that they have and the training that they have for what's just happening. We need to look to the future and what will happen and what might happen and to make concrete steps to invest in that. And the return of Jesus is sure, and so you need to invest in his return. And this is something that's really challenging in our culture uh, and perhaps more challenging than it has been in any other generation with healthcare and long living, with constant advertising to encourage you to make the most of now. The idea of preparing yourself for eternity is nowhere on the radar. When was the last time that you saw an advert in the newspaper saying, don't worry about that holiday, it's okay, you'll be able to travel in the new creation. I don't think I've ever seen one like that. It's all about now. And COVID has put the pause button on our lives, and so you need to make sure you get out there and do as much as you can now, because who knows when we might have that happen again. Or you need to make up for lost time. Make the most of now. So that means we need to be all the more deliberate in investing in Jesus' return. And the first part of that from this passage is to love serving. And now everyone who is a Christian is a servant of Jesus. But do you love serving? It can be hard at times to serve. By its very nature, it's tiring. And sometimes it's possible to slip into this mindset of serving that it's a sort of necessity that you do for a while so that you'll get to do something more enjoyable later. <coughs> serving is a sort of necessary evil. And we see this all around us with the idea that you perhaps work really hard doing your job 60, 70 hours a week, but then it's me time. And then it's the opportunity to do stuff that I find fun. But no, Jesus is encouraging us here in the light of his return to love serving. Even those people and those occasions where we frankly don't really want to. He encourages us to love serving, to feel privileged to serve. And he does that here by really dignifying the role of a servant. He shows here by his own service that serving is an honourable thing. He didn't just serve us on the cross so that one day we could do everything for him. He serves to show his character, one of a servant. It's an honourable thing to serve. And he encourages us that as a man, he could serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray and strive for the Spirit to conform us, to be like Jesus in this way. In those moments where, I know as I've had them, as I've been preparing for this, and someone calls saying, Dad! help. And you have to go and you think, I was just getting into that. And then, all oh, right, okay, I'll head off to help you on the toilet or something like that. But you know, that, those moments, this has really helped me to think, Lord, help me to love serving. Help me to love serving in the way that you want me to serve, not in the way that I would quite like to be doing right now. But it's helped to be able to pray for that and to remember that serving isn't just the thing you do until you can be served. And how that love of service would transform our homes, uh, our workplaces, our church. That we're not serving to gain later, but we're serving because that's who our master is. And serving as a thing is a good thing to be doing. 
And also the, the serving, loving of serving, is just to see that serving has a purpose. Serving, I just want you to imagine being in that house, waiting for the master to come back. And no doubt there were some servants there who were diligently getting on with what they should have been doing. And there were probably others who were pretending to be diligent. And then there were others who, by the end of it, were basically just completely slacking. And you could just imagine the, those who were actually getting on with it, kind of getting really annoyed and saying to the other people, oh, he's not doing anything. But what if they knew what was in store for them? What if they knew that when the master was coming back, the people who were attent and alert would be invited into this magnificent banquet? Wouldn't that change the way that they went about their, their duties? They would really be wanting to make sure that they got all the best quality food out on the tables, wouldn't they? They wouldn't be thinking, oh, well, that'll do. Well, you have that advanced warning. Jesus is telling you that this is what it's going to be like. And so that gives your service for people, for Jesus' sake, a purpose. In fact, it is the continuation of Jesus' service on earth, and it's somehow contributing in some mysterious way to the coming of his kingdom in all its fullness. Your service, small acts done for Jesus, are actually part of his kingdom coming on this earth. And there's, a, a, again, a mysterious verse that needs a sermon in itself on Revelation. It says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. That's Revelation 14, 13. The things that you do in this life uh, for Christ will somehow follow you. We don't know exactly what the rewards are, but with a master beyond your wildest dreams, you can be sure they're not going to disappoint. Serving is Christ-like. Serving is purposeful. You are Jesus' precious servant, so love serving. And then even more practically then, put your money to good use. And this is the second way in this passage that Jesus encourages you to invest in his return. And you have to look above, and that's why I started the reading at, at verse 32. So if you, if you look up there again, um, Jesus says to the disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus has in mind investing in eternity as being something that we actually practically do with our money. And the key verse there is verse 34, where Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, where, what you do with your money is where you invest your heart. So if you want to invest in Jesus' return, you need to start putting your money towards things which will promote the glory of his kingdom to help others to make sure they are there with you in his kingdom. And that will actually give you the kind of eager desire for Jesus to come that is necessary to receive his blessing. So are you using your money with Jesus' return in mind? I had a news flash come up on my phone the other day that talked of some people who spend a lot of time wondering about whether each purchase they make will make uh, will be good for the environment, whether that's a sustainable purchase. And that may well be a, an important concern for you, and it's not a bad one, but are you using your money with Jesus' return in mind? Not in a kind of neurotic way that means that you struggle to know which product to buy every time you go to the supermarket, but thinking about the big decisions in life. Do you look out for how you can give to the needy? And it's been moving to see this occurring among churches both in and around Ukraine, including the UK, over the last month. But let's look to bless our local area too, those in our family. And there's a wonderful example of the way that this brought amazing gospel fruit in the life of a Victorian preacher called Charles Simeon. 
uh, who some of you may know went to um, preach in a church called Holy Trinity Church up in Cambridge and he was really not liked by his parishioners and they actually locked the pews to stop people from going to hear him preach. That's how much they didn't like him. Um, and he carried on uh, and one of the things that was interesting that I read in a biography about him, uh, the biographer writes that he had a noble indifference to money and his active involvement with the relief for the poor in the area went a long way to overcoming the prejudices against him. I'll read that last bit again. His active involvement with the relief for the poor in his area went a long way to overcoming the prejudices against him. And I wonder whether we would find the same in our day, where there are prejudices against Christians, especially those who will hold to what the Bible teaches about so, so certain controversial issues. But I just wonder whether an active involvement with relief for the poor in the area would go some way to overcoming the prejudices against us. And I found with uh, the, the whole area of money use that the notion of sort of wartime living to be a helpful analogy. That it's not about austerity, but about using money for the right things. Giving it away sacrificially to help others prepare for the return of Jesus. So as we finish, um, let me read again from verses 35 to 36. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. And maybe as you've heard this message, you are feeling pretty worn out. Perhaps it's been a tiring term at university, or you're beset with fears and troubles, facing doubts, trouble by what's going on on the international stage, or maybe just trouble by the fact that your own body doesn't seem to have as much energy as it used to. And you're feeling that your lamp is burning pretty low. Perhaps you've listened and realised that you're not a servant of Jesus yet. Or at least if you are, you're holding back something from him. And Jesus tells this story to stun you and that you will be excited about his coming. And to move you from that position of doubt and fear and suspicion to one of trust uh, and joy and excitement. And he wants you to think of him, to think of him now, to think of him as you go home, to think of him throughout the week, and perhaps for longer, to see him in this story, as the, that he really is the master worth waiting for. See this master who serves his servants, did it gladly on the cross, he happily does it now through his church. He will delight to do it for all eternity. It's who he is. Let that stunning truth warm you this morning. And he's coming back. And he's calling you to base your life on this fact. To look forward to that eternal way in which he will serve you day by day it's going to be better than the best banquet at Buckingham Palace. So will you hear his call to invest in eternity this morning? Will you love serving? Will you put your money to good use? It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. Jesus tells you the truth. Jesus really is the master worth waiting for. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bow before you upon hearing these wonderful words. We're so grateful that you've preserved them for us in the scriptures, in our own language, that we can understand them. We thank you that we have queens and nobles and state banquets to just give us some kind of glimpse and help us to understand what Jesus is talking about here and to be absolutely shocked 
that you, the master of the universe, the creator of all things, the sustainer, the one whose glory fills the heavens, the nations of the earth are just a drop in a bucket for you. But yet you are the God who serves. We praise you for revealing that in Christ, the one who humbled himself and took on human nature in order to serve. You could have wrapped up the world years ago and still enjoyed your eternal glory, the eternal glory of the Trinity. But you chose to serve rebels in this world in the most costly way. And we praise you that this is not just something that you did for a while, but that it's your heart to carry this on for all eternity. We thank you and praise you that your kingdom will be Jesus serving and all those who are in him imitating that service that will be the feast and the party and the banquet that's beyond any we could ever know. So Father, thank you for giving us a glimpse into that today. And we pray for all of us to be impacted and stunned by what has happened here. And we pray that we would orient our lives to invest in the return of Christ. Father, help us when our lamps are burning low to seek you, to pray that your spirit would give us that love of service, that strengthening, that realisation of Christ's love for us. And we pray that you would help us to make those financial decisions that would be filled with faith and filled with the priorities of your kingdom. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our service by singing a final hymn. Uh, which is based on these words. Let's stand to sing. remain standing as we pray. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Amen.